What up everybody, I'm in Seabrain, Florida, right here, at the Seabrain Historical Society Archives and Museum, which they actually recently moved into that building. It used to be at the library over there. We're gonna go and do a tour and check this place out. It's been on my list for a while. Okay, I can't wait to go in there and have this experience for myself, but share it with you guys. All right, let's head in there. All right. Well, I'm just curious here. I, I saw everybody walking. We're just starting on tour. Oh, oh, how pretty. Now, if I need to sit down, where can I sit? Why don't we sit right over here? Okay, not yet. Why don't we sit down right now and I'll start the conversation, then we'll go. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Wherever you're comfortable. Any of the furniture you can sit in. He said we could sit. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more comfortable sitting than standing. Come on in, sir. Jim Pollard and I'm the director of the Historical Society and today I'm wearing two hats because I'm getting to be an archivist down in the archive and I'm getting to be a historian up in the museum. Well congratulations. <laughs> Where are you from? Peoria, Illinois. Are you here living or are you just visiting? We just bought a place in the in the bluffs just a month ago. Okay. So I just took a ride around Lake Jackson. I just literally, I just literally put the bike back in the truck. And I saw you putting your bike in the truck. That's wonderful. That was a 10 mile hike. Did yeah, you know that's that? not very far. Yeah. That, I think 10 miles is exhausting. It's I wouldn't want to take there. 10 mile hike. Yeah, we're originally from up north, um, New York. Okay. We've been down here about 10 years or more. Okay. Oh, Super. And this is just a day trip down here today? Oh, no, no. Well, well, yeah, mostly. Because we, uh, we we went to the one museum in, in Avon Park, and then we're going to visit another one okay. after this. Okay, you're going to have a Lake Placid? No, um, the Sea Museum. Next time. Okay, the Sea Museum. Yeah, Lake Placid's going to be next time. Okay, it's out on Kenilworth, like you're going out to the airport or the racetrack of where that was at. Okay, well this house is fairly new. We leased this building from the city, and it's called the Weigel House Museum. Dr. Weigel was an evangelist and songwriter from the early 1900s, active from about 1911 to 1960. Uh, he traveled extensively. Uh, this was a good location because back in the early days particularly, they traveled by train and they could get on the train here and basically go anywhere in the United States that he wanted to go. On the top of that bookcase over there, when we get up, you can get a better view of it. Uh, we have some pictures of Dr. Weigel. I think there's one of his wife and then had piano and everything. Uh, this is a typical Florida bungalow, built in 1922. Uh, no air conditioning, so you'll notice the ceilings are higher than they would be today, because mm -hmm. uh, it costs more to air condition the higher ceilings. Uh, you'll notice that the windows all good cross ventilation, because they would have had screens in the windows and you had good cross ventilation. The Weigels had no children, so there's one bedroom, and then in the back is what I call a sleeping porch. It was all glass windows, so when you open that up and wanted to sleep out there in the summertime, you had the nice, as cool a breeze as you could get coming in off of the lake. On this bookcase uh, is a talking about Rex Beach. Rex Beach was a very well-known author that lived here in Sebring in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, he was very successful. Uh, he was born in Pennsylvania, but moved with his family to Tampa when he was very young. At the age of 14, he went to Winter Garden, excuse me, Winter Park, Florida, to Rollins Preparatory School, which is also part of Rollins College. 
and he went to, through there. He attended one year at Rollins College, and then he decided he sort of got the wanderlust. Uh, he decided to go to law school. I don't. I thought you needed a a law a degree to go into law school, but I guess back in the 1900s, maybe that wasn't the case. But the real thing was that he ended up in Chicago, and that's when the Klondike Gold Rush was going on in Alaska. So during the summer, he would go to Alaska and pan for gold, and he did some writing of short stories and things that he would sell to magazines to help subsidize his income. And then in the winter time, he would come back to Chicago and go to school. By the time he was 25, he was quite well known and quite well established. His first book was a book of collections of all of his short stories that was put together. Three of his novels were made into movies. One of his novels has been made into movies three separate times. He was a smart businessman because he, re I guess being an attorney, it helped. He retained the movie rights to the books, so that meant that he had control of whatever they were wanting to do, and he actually assisted in writing the scripts for the movies as well as having written the, the novel. Two of the movies premiered here in Sebring, Florida in the 1930s at the Circle Theater up here on Circle Drive. Uh, that building is still standing and it's owned by Champions for Children and it's used for fundraising and things of that nature. Uh, sits at the corner of Circle Drive and North Commerce Street. His home is still standing, it's privately owned, it's up about a mile to the north on Lakeview. It's a very pretty home, has a, you probably rode right by it. It had the pretty uh, masonry block wall all the way around, yeah. everything perfectly landscaped. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually committed suicide there in 1947. His wife had passed away in 1945. He was losing his eyesight and he had throat cancer. And so he just was very depressed and he just didn't feel like he could go any further. Uh, he was very philanthropic. Uh, he, it is said that he supported over 50 families. He and his wife supported 50 families during the Depression that would have probably just literally starved to death had they not had some assistance. He was very generous with the band and other areas because at that time the school board didn't support the band. They had to find their own support and so he was very instrumental in helping to accomplish that. Uh, he was quite successful in other businesses also. He had extensive holdings in land down towards Clewiston where he raised cattle and between here and Avon Park he had somewhat with muck land and he raised pineapples. He went to gladiolas and eventually developed some of the newer easterly liberalities and made a lot of money with that also. I guess he sort of had the Midas touch. The piano behind me is a 1942 Harrison piano. Uh, it came to us through the, uh, from the Woman's Club. Uh, it was, the Woman's Club in Sebring was fairly new in 1940. And they had bought a clubhouse over by the present Presbyterian Church. And when they got their clubhouse paid for, then they decided, well, we need another project. And so they decided we'll buy us a piano. So they did what any smart club will do. They accessed each member a dollar at each meeting to raise the money to purchase that piano. It has a wonderful tone. I'll be glad to play it for you before we leave. And the display case over in the corner behind the piano is a display of uh, Tommy McGuire material. Now, everybody I know, every one of you all knows exactly who Tommy McGuire is. Shall this be a test time? No, I won't do that to you. We'll do it at the end. Tommy McGuire was America's number two ace during World War II. He grew up here in Sebring. He was born in New Jersey. His parents divorced when he was four. Her parents lived here in Sebring, so they moved here and he went through the entire school system. After graduating from Sebring High School, he went to uh, Georgia Tech and then World War II broke out. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps and he became a very successful pilot. Unfortunately, 
almost towards the end of the war, January 7th of 1945, he was killed in a, in a crash. He, his plane literally fell apart because he was doing a very difficult maneuver trying to protect his wingman. That story is depicted in the top painting over there on the wall. Underneath there, you'll see a picture of his plane. He named it Pudgy after his wife. I can't imagine that being an endearing, particularly endearing term, but I guess she, she didn't have a chance to kill him because he died before he got there. And then we also have a letter from President Harry Truman expressing the regrets of the country for their loss. Over in the corner, in the that corner over there, we have a, an original Victrola. Uh, it works beautifully. All we have to do is crank it up and turn and put the needle on there. And we may do that and put on some really great dancing music so you all will be able to cut her, literally cut the rug out here in the middle here on the rug. All right, it's time to hop up now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma what movies did he do? Or you said he mentioned oh, three? I don't know all of them offhand. The most one you said was, there were three. There were three, and the most famous one was uh, Amazon of the Gods or something like that. I don't remember all the names of the movies any more than I know the 50 novels. I can get that information for yeah, you. Yeah, we can look it up. Also, from, at one time, our Lake Jackson, right out, you can see the lake from here, was, was named Rex Beach Lake. The city tried to change the name of the lake out here to Rex Beach Lake. He was not in favor of that. It didn't last very long. It didn't. But, but we, I act, see we maps. actually we actually do have some maps and things that shows that on there. Isn't there on the other side a Rex Beach part of it? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, maybe I'm mistaken. Okay. We have Hidden Beach. Veterans maybe that's what it was. Yes, Hidden Beach. It's the wall. Okay, we're going to go into the dining room. Oh, and that's the best chair in my house. Oh, yeah. I love that chair. And those bookcases have the lettuce glass. Of course, this is the bedroom in the front. In here, we're very fortunate. We have two sets, or we have three sets of Sebring, Ohio, China. Mr. Sebring had five brothers and two sisters. All of them owned their own pottery factories, which manufactured china and, and dishes, and other things also. This particular setting that's on the table this week is a piece that was made by the company that Mr. George Sebring owned. Uh, very popular pattern in the late 1900s, uh, 1910, some along where in that area. Uh, he retired early and turned the business over to his son Orville, and Orville ran it until about 1912, and then they both came to Florida. Down here in this corner is a family tree of the family. Uh, George Sebring Sr. and his wife are above the okay. picture. That's Mr. Sebring's mother and dad. Mm -hmm. And then the, his brothers and sisters in the portraits on the, each side of the family tree, both of those were made, one inside the house and one on the porch of the Sebring Mansion in Sebring, Ohio. Over there in the corner is an early map of downtown Sebring or the city of Sebring. Uh, two interesting things about that talks about the railroad that arrived in June of 1912 and uh, it came into the north end of Lake uh, North Commerce, not anywhere near where the railroad stations are, our station is now. Also you'll notice a fence that goes all the way around the property. That was to keep the animals that belonged in town in town and the animals <laughs> that should stay outside, outside. In this glass case, I have several things. These four uh, pieces are out of the Kenilworth Hotel that is closed. And uh, th their factory did not manufacture that. This was made by uh, companies in New York. George Sebring did build the Kenilworth Hotel in 1916 and then added on to it in 1918. This piece back here is a very popular pattern 
of the Sebring China in the 1920s. Fabergé approached them to add the silver ring and handle to make it a serving plate and they did that and that was made exclusively for Fabergé. The large plate over here in the corner was a very popular pattern back in the 1930s. Down here is the plate commemorating Sebring, Ohio's 75th anniversary. This plate is a commemorative plate that was given to the Sebrings, senior Sebring, on their 50th wedding anniversary in 1906. This picture here is a picture of the Sebring home. The Sebring home sat right next to over here in the parking lot where the library is. This picture over here, the smaller picture is four generations of the Sebring men. You have George Sebring Sr., George Sebring Jr., Orville Sebring, and Orville Jr. Down here in the bottom picture here, you have a picture of Orville Sebring and his family sitting on the dock behind their home. His home is actually still here. It's down here on Lakeview, just after Ridgewood comes into Lakeview. The picture on the little girl on the left is the only girl out of the second marriage. Her name was Dorothy. Uh, she was the youngest. She married a doctor and lived most of her life in Pennsylvania. When they retired, they did come back to Sebring. Over here you see another one of the sets of the Sebring China. And as people keep bringing in wonderful pieces of crystal and stuff to add. This picture, you can compare that to the other map. This was a picture in 1925, 26, and you can see Sebring had grown considerably. Any questions? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, when I found out the center of the city spokes out a different way, why did he, why did he do that instead of the traditional rectangle? You got your bicycle with you? Yes. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you how to get to Pinecrest Cemetery, go up the hill, find Mr. Seabrink's grave, <laughs> Nobody and knows. ask it. No one knows. knows. Really? Uh, it's, he traveled extensively. So some European towns are like that. Even Washington, D.C. has a center circle mm -hmm. that goes out and spoke. But why he did that in a little horse town like Seabrink, Florida at that time is really mm -hmm. amazing. I guess he just discovered that style and he liked it. Hey, he, he's flipping the billy, do what he wants to, huh? Right. What's your step if we go out of here along that path? That's called serenade. Okay. The pantry area we haven't done anything with yet. It's on my agenda. We're trying to get the kitchen finished. Other than the appliances, we can't afford to have replicated uh, appliances, unless one of you all would like to donate about $20,000, and then I will have them here next week. Uh, any takers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> one thing we do see in here is you, most people come in here and say, well, I remember my grandma's kitchen looking sort of like this. You'll see a lot of the same type dishes, the same kind of service, the same kind of kitchen utensil. The, I love the, the example of the uh, toaster down there. Uh, it's, you open it up, put your slice of bread in it, and you toast it one side at a time, but you had to remember if you didn't, it didn't have a timer on it. When you saw the smoke coming out that was burning, when you took it, flipped it over, went the other direction. Did any of y'all ever remember using that kind of stuff? Mm, no, it was a bit like before that. my time. A little before your time. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Watch your step as we go here. This is our little gift shop. One thing that I would suggest if you purchase anything, this book was done for the Heritage Festival, but more importantly, it's a reprint of a book that was done for the county's 50th anniversary. It's an excellent way to learn anything you've ever wanted to know about Highlands County uh, early days and right on up with some stuff current because we updated it this year. We have vintage postcards. Some of the 
original Sebring postcards that the copyrights were out, I was able to duplicate, and we have them available. Since we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, I've created a, and I am creating, as I have time, a display on Highlands County. This is an example of the courthouse. The courthouse was built in 19, completed in 25. They moved in in early 1926. It's still standing and serving as primarily the court area of the county because they've added a new government center where most of the offices that we deal with, like going to renew our driver's license or pay property taxes or that kind of stuff, but it's in the government center. Alice County was established in 1921, April the 23rd. Big fight uh, between the divisionists and the non-divisionists to create. We were part of DeSoto County. DeSoto County was a huge county and it was a long way. It was a, a two-day trip to go to Arcadia to the city county seat and so uh, they had a, a division committee and Dr. Etheridge who was a dentist that lived in DeSoto City, he was elected to the House of Representatives from this area when he got to Tallahassee, he introduced a bill to create Highlands, Hardy, Charlotte, and Glades County. All of those counties came out of the old DeSoto County. And of course, DeSoto County remains. So five counties still resist out of the original one. The first 4th of July, uh, Sebring hosted a great big party and everyone was invited. This is a tag from 1921. And uh, this is the book from the, night, night, the 50th anniversary. We took this and updated that other book. This is one of my favorite rooms. It houses three distinct things I think are important about Seabury. Obviously, the circle that you were just discussing, where did that come from, with the spokes that fanned out. Uh, most of those buildings are still standing, uh, at least at the present time. Uh, I don't know of any of those that are in jeopardy of being torn down. Many of these buildings in this area, including these two, this one and next door, are in jeopardy of being demolished so the city can do a new waterfront project. Our new resident needs to step in and come help us fight yes. that. They want, these kids want to bulldoze everything down. And this case talks about Highlands Hammock. Highlands Hammock was a park before it became a state park. Uh, they had raised the money. It was privately managed. They had their own operating system. 1950, the state hired a botanist named Carol Beck, and she was sent to Highlands Hammock to do two things. Number one, to identify all of the plants that were in there. She did that and compiled the book. She, her other job was to find way for the state park to make money to help become more self-sustaining. She did two things that are still going on today. Number one, the bottom picture down here is an early tram. She started the tram tours. She's standing there beside it talking to the group that's on the tram. The other picture to the left of that is a picture of the Vesper services that were held out there in the 30s. Seabury had a population of around 1,000, but during the winter months when they did the Vesper services, they would have four or 5,000 people out of the state park during the Vesper services. Rex Beach, by the way, was the first president of the Highlands Hammond Park before it became a state park. It was the 19th 35 is when the state was starting their state park system. They approached them and they turned it over to the state. This is a salute to the race. Uh, the first race was held January 31st, 1950. It was only a six hour race. The first car that won was the number 19. That's Mrs. Schumacher, a well-known person, actually lived in this house next door, sitting on the car. The picture was taken in front of Harder Hall. This is just other memorabilia and stuff that's been part of the race throughout. The big trophy is an early 
trophy uh, for sportsmanship. The name on there that you probably readily recognize would be Steve McQueen. Mm -hmm. He won that in 1972 because he raced that year with his foot in a cast. He broke it three weeks earlier in a motorcycle race. So they simply taped sandpaper to the bottom of the cast and he took his turn driving in that race. This is a replica of the USS Hollins, it was a troop transport, went into service in 1940, late 1942, early 1943. It's uh, carried people primarily in the Pacific. Uh, it carried troops to every one of the major uh, battles in the Pacific. Carried about 500 men. Uh, it was mothballed after the war and eventually scrapped. Henry's Field, very important thing during World War II. Florida played a major role in the United States training in that, during the war because of our perfect climate and the pretty good weather and everything. We got over 300 military bases. Henry Field was here in Sebring. It was the same time the bombing range came into being up in Avon Park. The only thing that's still out there is the tower. It's been restored and the runways. Everything else is pretty much gone. That's where they have the race every year out in that area. The original race is raced around the roads of Hendricks Field. <laughs> the case over here has some artifacts from early businesses here in Sebring. The Con Department Store Mr. Kahn came to Sebring in 1922. The family is still very active in the community. Uh, IGA store, White House IGA store, and of course the Cat House restaurant was world famous. Uh, and Gilbert Drug signed from the original store. And a deed, I think it's a book talking about loans and things from one of the mortgage companies. Standing up is not my strong suit. We'll wait for them to catch up. Um, didn't you have like the museum and the library? I remember reading somewhere online. We we had the archives. This was all well no. We had a small museum. Most of it was just the cases you've seen mm -hmm. down underneath the library. But we were able to separate the two. The archives are still down there. That's where you call me. And then the museum up here. People want to know why I painted the room pink or had it painted pink. And more importantly, why in the world do I have a bed? Well, the pink is a salute to Gracie McCoy, who was a very well-known realtor here in Sebring in the late 50s, 60s, and even into the very, very early 70s. She uh, was very good at her craft. She was responsible for two manufactured home divisions that here are still here, Francis one and two. She was instrumental in luring Westinghouse here to start Spring Lake subdivision. Her trademark was pink. Everything was pink. Uh, she even had her dogs painted dyed pink. She had a pink Cadillac to haul her clients around with. She was very flamboyant. There's a picture of her on the case over here. I've got some more stuff. Everything's a work in progress. The bed. I wanted a place to be able to demonstrate different uh, American crafts that are almost forgotten, such as crocheting, embroidery, that kind of stuff. And this is a perfect way to do that. This case here is talking about the band during the era of the Gustav. Professor Gustav is this picture here. He came in 1927, he was hired by the school system to start the band. 
typical government, they want to start the band, they have no money to start the band, so he has to turn to civic clubs and himself to provide the musical instruments and stuff. But he was very good the first time he took the band to contest. Uh, they performed so well, the judges said, well, you've done very well this time. You've made excellent on everything. You can never perform there again. You will have to perform with the grade A schools, which was the big schools from around the state. Hmm. They performed there the entire time that the two father and son were the music band directors here. Mr. Dr. Uh, Professor Gustav is really known as the father of music in the school system for Highlands County. He was instrumental in helping get it started in Avon Park, Lake Placid, and Seabrook, many times paying for stuff out of his own pocket. This is just a collection of stuff that been given over the years, saluting the bands in that era. This case is just filled up with some stuff about the churches and things of that nature, but I do have coming in on the 14th, I think it is, of uh, April, uh, June, is going to have a, a Seminole Indian doll collection being brought in on a temporary exhibit. Any questions? about anything. No, very interesting. Just a comment, this is stunning. This is stunning. That bedspread is stunning. I a missionary seen. brought that back to someone Beautiful. here in Sebring. It was done in the Philippines. The fabric wow. is actually woven out of pineapple uh, stuff. They make their fabric out of the so pineapple. Cute. It is gorgeous, isn't it? Oh, never seen anything like it. Is, is this a closet, I'm assuming? It's a closet, yes, sir. That's another neat thing. Most closets in those eras didn't have closets, but there's actually a closet in the back area and this area. Is there a reason why there's no door handle? That's the way we inherited it, and we just haven't done anything with it. And then Dr. Weigel, um, his internationally famous hymn was Nobody Will Ever Care. That's still very popular today and it's been translated into 35 foreign languages. We all would like to have some vintage lingerie sometime if you're dressing up to go to Ybor City or something. <laughs> feel free to come down and I'll check it out to you and, and you can bring it back. Uh, Women don't wear stuff like that. They don't. Beautiful. Yeah. Gracie was such mm. an inspiration. She. <laughs> My friend from Savannah, Georgia, met her in a European airport. She said, where are you going, handsome? He said, I'm going to fly to London. She said, no, you're coming That's with us. Sad. And they ran around her entourage. Did you hear me talk? I talk, yeah, I I talk loud so you can hear me. Yeah, but I heard it often. And he gave her uh, things on listening. I'm going to play his most famous hymn for you. And you know what? It's so nice and comfortable here. You may just want to stay here and let him go to the other museum. No, we're going to go to another, the next one. Yeah, we're going to another one. Well, if you're comfortable, we'll just stay there and he can come back and pick you up. And I got that earbook right out of the belt. Sort of depressed over some family matters. 
And the story goes, him telling this, uh, he went down by the lake, that house of course wasn't there, and God spoke to him and gave him the words in about 20 minutes, and he came up and put the music to it, and it's still just as popular today than it was when he did it. This is why we say it's such a Here is the words, if you all would like to see them, you can have that. And Temple University yes, has the Yes, I just don't remember. Department. So we were just horrified to find out that they had been meeting. Oh, and they were just yeah. going to open up the library. Now you know it. Now I know it. Three historical homes, and it was a family. Yeah, it was nice. Oh, got the I see my pages are gone. If you will fill in on here, give me your name. I just want to keep record of who's been here. Is there anything in that one uh, room that we skip by? Sir? Is there anything in that one room that we skip by? Just a restroom. Oh, bathroom. Yeah. And we've done nothing with it. Just operational. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad that uh, you're comfortable. Yeah, I am too comfortable. And uh, she just had a whole bunch of them from World War II, so. Was this a popular song or just at that time? A swing or?